Welcome. Good to see you all this morning. We'll kick off with the notices. Uh, so, warm welcome. Where have they gone? John and Philippa. <laughs> there they are. Great to have you with us uh, this morning. Look forward to your, your ministry shortly. Um, we've, we've prayed for John and Philippa for, for many years. I prayed for them long, long before I had the privilege of meeting them. Uh, long-term friends of, of Mark and Sharon as well. So, yeah, welcome. Good to have you with us this morning. Um, and John will be preaching for us this morning and then also this evening on Hebrews 11. Uh, so our evening service, 5.30 for refreshments, 6 o'clock start. And if you're not a normal, regular attendee at our evening service, uh, do come along. It's a definitely a different feel here in the evening. Um, but yeah, come and, come and join us if you can. Um, reminder, Norman's funeral will take place this coming Wednesday, 11 o'clock start at St. Peter and St. Paul's Church in Webley. Um, so you are very, very welcome to come along. The burial will be uh, private, family only, uh, but then everyone's welcome to the funeral service and also to the wake, which is at the Old Salutation, also in Webley. And pretty, please do be praying for Eva and the family, uh, and also me, please, uh, for Wednesday's Thanksgiving service for Norman's life. Home group this week, um, you'll get messages from home group leaders about times and dates and, and who's hosting and this Thursday the worship team are going to be meeting 7.30 uh, to practice for the Christmas carols and hymns so uh, worship team please make every effort to get along there and I have a note a prayer request from Gordon and I'm going to read it out Gordon and family would like to request prayer for Isaac, Gordon's 17-month-old grandson, a great-grandson. He is due to undergo open-heart surgery on Wednesday this week to, to repair a congenital defect. He has already had one operation when he was only a few weeks old and from which he recovered well. However, these procedures are a source of great anxiety for his mum, uh, Gordon's granddaughter Jess, and his dad Ryan, as well as for Gordon's daughter Ruth. Jess and Ryan helped to lead a church in Cheltenham where the members are also praying for a safe outcome and for the Lord to completely heal this precious little boy and to bring a sense of peace to the whole anxious family. Thank you. Please uh, remember to pray. I, I don't know how you've arrived in church this morning, whether you're really looking forward to it and you woke up thinking, oh, I can't wait to go to church, or whether you had the opposite feeling. You woke up and you've had a difficult week, difficult night, difficult morning. Uh, that's certainly been the case for us in our house. Hospital billets in the middle of the night, waking up tired, thinking, have I had any sleep? This is crazy. And you feel a bit irritable, a bit frustrated. And if you're honest, I, I don't know if I feel like going to church this morning. I don't know if I feel in a good enough place to come to church. I wonder if you've ever said that. But it's exactly the place we need to be when we're feeling like that, isn't it? We need to meet with Jesus. And you say, well, I can meet with Jesus apart from going to church. It's not quite the same, is it? Jesus associates himself with the church. He's the head. He's your shepherd, not me. You're his sheep. We are his sheep. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you need some rest? Are you feeling heavy laden at the moment? Then come to Jesus. Let's stand together and sing to Jesus. Come people of the risen King.
stay standing. We're going to go straight into our next song in a moment, Who Has Held the Oceans. But before that, I'm going to read Psalm 57 from verse 7. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's sing together. Who has held the oceans? Behold our God. Well, good morning, everyone. It is lovely to be with you again. It's fantastic to be with you this morning, and especially good morning, boys and girls. It's brilliant to see you here this morning. Uh, later on, when you're outside, I'm going to be speaking uh, to the adults from the Bible about the God we've just been singing about from a book in the Bible called Daniel and Daniel chapter 1. And in Daniel chapter 1, God does some surprising, amazing, unexpected things. So to help us to think a little bit about Daniel this morning, I want you to have a look at this picture on the screen. And, and there you've got a picture of a bus. 
Now, who do you think is going to be getting on the bus? What kind of people get on a bus? Yes. A person, maybe. Yeah, who else? A person going to school. Does anyone get a bus to school? Maybe so. No, none of you get a bus to school. Well, some people get a bus to school. Who else might be going on a bus? People trying to get to work, yeah. Who do we, yeah, go on, give us one more. A bus driver. A bus driver would be, yeah. You'd really expect the bus driver to be on the bus, wouldn't you? So let's have a look who's getting on this bus. And, and that, well, I didn't expect that. An elephant getting on a bus? OK, you get where this is going. Here's the second picture. So here's the donkey. What's surrounding the donkey? Hands up if you think, oh, go on. What do you think surrounding the donkey? Total blackness. Well, at the moment, yes. <laughs> uh, picture's going to be revealed, yes. Go. Lots of whiteness. Hands up if you think he's surrounded by lots of green, green grass. Oh, there's one, one vote for that. How about lots of brown, sticky mud? Or hands up if you think he's in the desert. Uh, a few more. Let's have a look. No, the donkey's on a boat. <laughs> of course the donkey's on a boat. Well... It's, it's amazing, surprising, unexpected. And when we turn into the Bible to Daniel chapter 1, it's amazing and surprising and unexpected because here's Daniel and his friends, and they're friends of God, but they're not where they're supposed to be. As friends of God, they should be in Jerusalem, but they're all the way over in Babylon or Shinar. And as friends of God, they should be free, but now they're captives, they're slaves. They're not where they're supposed to be. But then we see something else unexpected happen in the next picture. Daniel and his friends are offered the best food and wine to eat and drink from the king's table. Well, they're captives. They wouldn't have expected the best food to eat. And then we see an even further surprising thing in the next one because they say, no, thank you to the lovely food. They say, please, can we have 10 days of vegetables and water? Oh, let's think about that for a moment. In my bag here, I'm going to give you some choices of what you could have to eat. Are you ready? Um, let's go with, would you like some chocolate or celery? Hands up for chocolate. <laughs> Hands up for celery. Yeah, I'm thinking you're wanting celery. Yeah, that's going to be good for celery. No, you'd want the chocolate, wouldn't you? Why would you have the celery when you can have the chocolate? OK, here's, here's one more choice for you. Would you like, would you like pizza or a parsnip? Uh, hands up for pizza, anyone? No, not really. Hands up for parsnips. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, Daniel and his friends, remarkably, they say, oh, we don't want the chocolate and the pizza. We want the, we want the celery and the parsnips. Well, that's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Well, you say yay because God does something amazing, surprising, unexpected, because in the next picture we see that actually after 10 days, Daniel and his friends were stronger and better than all of the others around them. How's that possible? Well, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. You see, sometimes God does some amazing, surprising, unexpected things. God gave Daniel and his friends health and knowledge. What's God given us? Well, God's given us his son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And when he sends his son Jesus into this world, he, he doesn't wear a crown of gold, but he ends up wearing a crown of thorns. He's not born into a palace, but he's born into a manger. And Jesus, who lives, then dies on a cross, and God does something amazing, surprising, and unexpected, because he raises him back to life again. You see, Daniel chapter 1 is going to teach the adults later on, and it's teaching us right now, that God's always in control, even when it doesn't look like it. And we can trust God because he can do some surprising, amazing and unexpected things. Well, boys and girls, let me pray for you right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you are in control of all things. Thank you that even when it doesn't look like it, you do some amazing, surprising, unexpected things. 
And we thank you for what you've given us. You've given us your son, Jesus. Thank you that he died on the cross. Thank you that you raised him back to life again. And we pray, Father God, that we might receive your gift of grace by faith in Jesus, as we trust you completely. I pray that for the boys and girls. Pray that for the adults too, that we might be men and women, boys and girls of faith in the Lord Jesus. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. So, boys and girls, when you go home this afternoon, and if your parents or grandparents put pizza, exactly, <laughs> say, what is this nonsense? I would like the vegetables, please. You won't say that because you are going to honour your mother and father, <laughs> and you'll eat whatever they put in front of you. But, um, John, I can't remember you asking for permission for that photo of me and Mark and a few of the others with our <laughs> tops off. But... We give you the permission retrospectively. Let's stand together and sing again. My hope is built on nothing less. Beautiful hymn, Cornerstone. And once we come to the end of this hymn, the children are going to go out to Sunday school and crash. So let's stand together. Could we go back a couple of slides, please, Mark? Children, get out of here. That's the one. Uh, next one along. Nope. That's the one. 
Just something we've been thinking about quite a bit, looking at Romans, isn't it? About the righteousness that we can't find anywhere through works, through our birth, through our heritage, only in Jesus. When, I, when he shall come with trumpet sound, or may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless, I stand before the throne. There's not many of us here that feel faultless, is there? And yet, when Jesus returns, we will stand before him, and he will look at us, and he will say, faultless. Faultless, because we're dressed in his righteousness. Praise God. Father, we thank you so much for that truth that we've just been reminded of, that we've just sung about in joy, because we can't quite believe it ourselves, because we look at ourselves, we look, we don't even have to look that deep, Lord, and we don't see faultlessness, we see major fault. And yet, when we look beyond ourselves, and we look to Jesus, and we trust in him, and we claim his righteousness that's been imputed to us, Lord, we We can't do anything else but praise you and say thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am now righteous because of him. Oh, Father, please continue to bless us this morning. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please uh, turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read the whole chapter together. It's on page 737. If you're following along in the church Bibles, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. So this is God's word. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Bethshazar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your age? So you would endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the stewards took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, we're going to stand and sing again now. Grace is thy faithfulness. And then John is going to come and preach God's word to us. Please do take a seat. Well, could I encourage you, please, to open up your Bibles once more at Daniel chapter 1. And as we come to God's Word this morning, let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp for our feet. It is a light for our path. 
So we pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes this morning to see wonderful truths in your word. Open our ears to hear you speak to us. Soften our hearts that we may receive your truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, please do have Daniel chapter 1 open in front of you this morning. Daniel is a fascinating account of a man of faith who trusted in God. But of course, as we go to Daniel, you're automatically thinking in your mind's eye of Daniel 6, aren't you? Because that's what we know Daniel for, isn't it? Daniel and the lion's den. But as we think about the book of Daniel, there's loads of amazing, fantastic stories and accounts in there. There's the account of the fiery furnace. There's the writing on the wall. And then you start to think of all the dreams that there are and the visions in the book of Daniel. Large statues of gold, silver and bronze. Trees that reach up to the heavens. Sea creatures coming out of the depths. Or maybe this morning as you think of Daniel, you think of his wonderful prayer in chapter 9. Or his vision of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. And it fills your heart with joy and wonder. It's a truly breathtaking book, the book of Daniel, full of wonderful true accounts of this man of faith. But this morning I would like us to look together at Daniel chapter 1 because it's going to teach us that God is sovereign. God is sovereign over history. God is sovereign over humanity. And God is sovereign over his people. And as we look to the God whom Daniel knew this morning, I hope that it'll help us to live faithfully as God's people in this world. Daniel chapter 1 is going to give us hope to live in a hostile world. And that's the world you and I live in as Christians, isn't it? It's a hostile world. You've just got to turn on your television or radio or log on online and you see that the world seems to be against Christianity. We live in a society that, well, it doesn't like what Christians believe. Sometimes it doesn't like what Christians say or what Christians do. We are in a minority now, aren't we? And some of our views are, well, they're considered not just unacceptable, but perhaps even inexpressible. How can you and I as Christian believers live with hope in this hostile world that's against us? Well, Daniel chapter 1 is going to help us do that as we look to God who is sovereign, God who reigns supreme, God who's in control over all things. Daniel chapter 1 will give us hope in this hostile world. Now, the key to Daniel 1, if you've got that open in front of you, and it'll be a big help if you do, are are verses 2, verse 9, and verse 17. You'll see a little phrase repeated in each of those uh, verses. Just look at them with me. Daniel 1, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Verse 9. And God gave Daniel favour and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And verse 17, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. God gave, God gave, God gave. It's the Lord who gave King Jehoiakim, who delivered King Jehoiakim. It was God who caused the official to have grace and compassion towards Daniel. It is God who gave learning and skill to these young men. The text is hammering home the point three times. God gave, God gave, God gave. God is sovereign. God is sovereign over history. God's sovereign over humanity. He's sovereign over his people. He's in control of the great world events of history. And in this case, well, it's Nebuchadnezzar defeating Jehoiakim. It's the Babylonian invasion and victory. God's sovereign over humanity the interpersonal relationships we have with people along our daily life. And in this case, it's Daniel and the chief officials. But God's also sovereign over his people, over you and me. And in this case, it's the, well, it's the relocation, it's the re-education of Daniel and his friends. Let's have a look at the first of those. God is sovereign over history. You'll see that in verses 1 to 7. Look again, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. So he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. He said Daniel opens at a point of both national and personal crisis. There's a national crisis going on. The city of Jerusalem, while it's besieged, it's defeated, The temple contents, they're gathered up and carried off and put into the house of another god. 
looks like God's been defeated. It's a national crisis. But then it's also a personal crisis because the national always affects the individual and the personal. And here for Daniel and his three friends, they, they were living in the promised land. But now as young men in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign, they find themselves well, captured, dragged off into exile, taken away from their own land into a society that they didn't know or care about the God that they loved and served. They were dragged off to a place that wasn't impressed by their faith, that didn't know or care about the living God. So Daniel and his friends are exiles in a foreign land. They're strangers in a hostile world. And straight away, I hope you're resonating with Daniel and his friends. Yeah, that's me as a Christian living where I do today. Verses 1 and 2 give us both... Well, they give us both the historical fact, but also the theological explanation. They give us the historical facts, don't they? Because they tell us in verse 1 that it's, well, it's 605 BC, we know from our history books. King Nebuchadnezzar comes, you can read about it in 2 Kings 24. He besieges, he he takes a victory. It's real time, real place history. But verse 2, verse 2 gives us the theological explanation of what's going on, and and it really should come as a bit of a shock. Because Daniel ascribes ultimate sovereignty for the capture of Jerusalem to the Lord. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Daniel's view of God, his understanding of who God is, means that he sees these historical events through the lens of God's sovereign control of history. He says, God, you're in control of what's going on here. These opening verses are teaching us God is sovereign over history. He directs history as as he wills. Do you notice what Daniel's not asking? God, where are you? God, what are you doing? No, he's saying, the Lord has done this. He knows and he trusts that the sovereign God is in control of the world events of history that are panning out before him. Now, now that could either be quite shocking for you, or, or it could be quietly comforting. God's in control of all things. God's sovereign over what happens in our world, in our lives. And maybe that's helpful for us this morning, because perhaps you're asking, God, what are you doing in this world? So I turn on my news, God, where are you? Or maybe you're asking that for our own country, God, where are you in this country? Or perhaps more personally you're saying, Lord, in the circumstances I'm going through right now, where are you? Daniel's answer is to put his faith in a sovereign God, to trust God even when he can't see why and and even even when he can't see the end of events, he says, God, you are sovereign over history. The Lord has given Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now look what happens to them. We're told in verse 2 that they're taken along with the treasures off to Shinar. And when you read that in the Bible, Shinar or Babylon, especially Shinar, You should be taken in your mind's eye back to Genesis 11, because that's the Tower of Babel. That's happening in Shinar. That's where the the people came together to oppose God. But the point where people come together and say, God, we don't need you. We can live life without you, and to prove it, we're going to build this great big tower. That's who King Nebuchadnezzar is. He's saying, look, I can live in this world without you, God. I'm going to gather up all your stuff, and I'm going to ship it off to Shinar, and we're going to live here quite happily without you. Using this phrase, telling us that it's been taken to Shinar, the the writer's reminding us that, well, King Nebuchadnezzar has effectively set himself up against God. I'm king, you're not. I'll build my own tower and build my own kingdom. I'll go my own way. That again resonates with us, isn't it? Because that's where we live today. We live in Babylon. We live in Shinar. So if you live in Wellington, you're living in Babylon. And before you smugly think, well, actually, I live a little bit further south in Hereford, or I live up in Lempster, even if you live in Cannon Pion, oh, yes, you're living in Babylon. You're living in a place where people stand opposed to God's rule and reject God and say, God, I want to have nothing to do with you. And so we identify with Daniel and his friends because we're living in effectively the same place they are. We're living as scattered exiles, strangers, And God is sovereign even here. Well, what's going on in these first two verses? What's going on is God's faithfully keeping his word. Because several times before in the Old Testament, God's repeatedly said, look, if you fail to keep my covenant, if you fail to do these things, then these things will happen. 
Just listen to Isaiah 39 and verse 6. Isaiah 39, verse 6, God says, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. As we open up Daniel 1, God's just being faithful to his word. He said this would happen and now it is coming to pass. God remains faithful and trustworthy and true to his word. God's sovereign over history. Well, what happens in verses 3 to 5? Well, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar, this strange character, uh, commands uh, Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar is a bit of a strange character because on the one hand, he's intensely vain and, and he throws himself into fits of rage and he threatens all sorts of dreadful torture. But on the other hand, he's really kind and goes, well, you know, you can eat from my table and you can drink the best of my wine and let's look after you. He's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde character, but one thing he does know what to do is how to run an empire. What we're going to do is we're going to get the best, the cream of the crop uh, out of their land and we're going to bring them into our land and we're going to re-educate them, we're going to rename them, we're going to assimilate them into our culture. And Daniel and his friends are captured for that purpose. And when you read verse 4, that they're used without blemish and good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding and learning, well, try not to get too jealous, but they've got both the brains and the good looks. He's got the cream of the crop here. They're young men with great ability, and they were in high position back in Judah, and now they're taken off to Shinar. Do you see what God is doing? God's sovereign over history because he's making sure that the right people are in the right place at the right time for the unfolding of the rest of the book of Daniel. God's in control here. He's got his people that he wants to represent him in this foreign land in that right place. And in spite of what it might look and feel like for the defeated Jerusalem, God's in sovereign control of history. Even when it looks like God might have been defeated and all his contents of the temple have been carried off to Shinar, God's still in control. And of course, it's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that shows us that most clearly, doesn't it? When it looks like Jesus has been defeated because he's been nailed to the cross, when he's put into the tomb, It looks like the devil has won. Christ is crucified. It looks like defeat, and yet it is the means of our salvation. God raises him from the dead. Christ, who wears the victor's crown. Before he wears that, he wears the crown of thorns. Christ, the suffering servant who who bears this path of humility and seeming defeat. He's put to death by wicked men, but it's by God's set purpose and foreknowledge that he does it. God is in control of history. It's true in Daniel's day. It's true at the cross of Christ. And it's true for you and I today. So today we can say, Lord, as I look out upon the world and upon world events of history that are happening, I might be confused, I might be perplexed, and I might not see the end of the story, but I can trust you. God, you're in sovereign control. Give me the faith. Give me the hope to live out for you in this hostile world. God's sovereign over history. But then we see in verses 8 to 16 that God's sovereign over humanity. Do you notice in verse 8 there's a, there's a sharp contrast. You get a but Daniel. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favour and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. Daniel resolved, that is, he purposed in his heart. In other words, this is a, this is a carefully thought out action. He's, he's thought it out beforehand, he's determined this is what he will do. This is not on a whim or on the spur of the moment. So Daniel doesn't get to the point of going like, you've given me a new name, you've taken me into a new land, and I've got new literature to learn, that the food and wine's the, just the end of my tether, I can't take any more. No, 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 he, he's worked this out beforehand. This is where... I'm going to draw the line in the sand. Because think about it for a moment, for Daniel and his friends, the pressure to conform with the society that he's just been brought into must have been immense. As he's dragged out of Jerusalem, taken off to Shinar, 
Well, is his faith in God going to stand firm? You know, again, I hope you can identify with that. Living as a Christian in this world, there's a, there's a massive pressure just to conform with the world around you. You know, keep your head down. Don't, don't put your head above the parapet at all. Whether that's in your home, where maybe you're the only Christian. Maybe it's in your workplace. Uh, maybe it's just in the community, in the villages and towns where you live, with your neighbours. The pressure to conform is immense. And of course, we see Daniel and his friends, well, they've cooperated, haven't they? They've gone along with the new names. They've gone along with the new literature. Uh, they, they've cooperated, but without compromise. They were, they were living in the world, but not of the world, we might say. But it also means there comes a point where they're going to say no. There comes a point where they're going to say, enough is enough, and we draw a line in the sand here. Now, as you read through the book of Daniel, you're going to see them do that in, in really loud and very public ways. You know, that the, the fiery furnace, the whole sort of bowing down to the statue, uh-uh, we ain't going to do that. Everyone else can bow down, we're standing firm. Uh, the lion's den, you know, I'm going to carry on praying to God, and you're not going to stop me. Very loud, very public. Here, their first resistance, well, it's really quiet and it's quite undramatic. It's a conversation between two people in the back office, isn't it? Daniel knows that a line has to be drawn. In order to serve God, he's going to make a firm stance. And for Daniel, verse 8, he's resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So that's where Daniel's drawing the line in the sand. Now, before I do myself out of a really nice Sunday lunch, I'm looking forward to, thank you, uh, that's not where I'm drawing the line in the sand. Jesus makes it clear, doesn't it? Jesus makes it clear, it's not what goes into us that makes us unclean, it's what comes out of our hearts that it makes us unclean. So, so Jesus says, look, the issue's not about food. For some people, they'll say, well, for Daniel, it could have been that the food was offered to idols, and that's what he didn't want to get involved in. I think it's more an issue of, when you sit down for a meal together with someone, there's, a, there's an allegiance, there's a commitment, there's an obligation, there's a, we're here together, and, and you'll do that around the Sunday lunch table today, won't you? You sit down together, maybe as a family, or with friends, or perhaps you're offering hospitality to others, and there's a sense of here we are together and we, we break bread, we share food, there's a, there's a oneness, there's a unity. And I think for Daniel, he just wants to draw a line in the sand and go, King, look, we'll go with the new name and the new literature and all that new lifestyle, but the food and wine, we're not at one with you. We're not sitting down to break bread with you, we're not going to take food from your table or wine to drink, we're going to draw the line there. Well, whatever it is, he draws the line, and we read in verse 9 that God gave Daniel favour and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. God, God is sovereignly working over humanity. And here it's this relationship between Daniel and his captor. Someone who doesn't believe in God, someone who doesn't trust the chief eunuch, the chief official, God is sovereignly at work even through him. Now, that should be quite surprising, isn't it? Because this, this chief eunuch, well... He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about Daniel so much. But God's grace is being seen in the harshest of environments. A quiet grace. God at work through people who don't know and love him. And God graciously is at work in through our circumstances and lives. Maybe you can even see that in the lives of unbelievers that you rub shoulders with every day. God is working all things out in accordance with his will. So we see in verse 9 that the, the Lord gives... God gives Daniel favour and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. And you think, great, things are going to work out well for Daniel. And then you read verse 10. And the chief eunuch said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. In other words, Daniel, that sounds really interesting, and I like the idea of you having vegetables and water, but thank you, but no thank you. Do you know, I, I fear the king. In fact, I quite like my head on my shoulders, and so I'm going to just say no. So the guy who's showing compassion and favour towards Daniel says no, and the door shuts in his face. What does Daniel do at this point? Go off in a huff? Well, thank you, God. I, I thought you were in control over humanity, and, and this guy was showing, this, this guy was showing me favour and compassion, and now he's just said no. Now again, you see his, his trust in God. God, I trust you're sovereign over humanity. And he just quietly goes down the chain of the command to the guard, verse 11. So Daniel says to the steward, of whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. 
Let's be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. Do you see his bold faith? The guy who shows him favours just said no and slammed the door in his face. And so he just quietly goes and has another little conversation with someone to go, no, no, I'm trusting that God's going to be at work. And this guy's going to say yes, and he does. And he says, let's do this 10-day test. Let's test us out and see how we are after the 10 days. And of course, as we saw with the children, verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine that they were given to drink and gave them vegetables. Daniel is courageous in his stand, gracious in his attitude, and he prospers as a result of it. God's sovereign over humanity. And he's working through this chief steward now. Now, how do we apply this to ourselves? Do we say, right, let's, let's do the Daniel diet and draw near to God. Uh, that's a great thing to do for the next 10 days. No, not quite. You see, it's not the Daniel diet that does it. It's the grace of God working in and through him. It's God who gives him the knowledge and understanding. It's God who enables them to look better and fitter than all of the others God is sovereign even over the hostile humanity that's against them and God is at work through his people. It reminds us that that's what happened to the early church. As they were opposed in the book of Acts by the world around them, we read in Acts chapter 2 that at the church every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. God sovereignly acting over humanity to work out his purposes. Yes, he wants Daniel and his friends in those top positions, so they end up far more knowledgeable and far more fitter than all of the others. God wants his church to grow, and, and the early church enjoyed the favour of all the people. Do you see how God's working out his purposes in humanity? Not by spectacular means, but by ordinary means. This isn't the moving of mountains, is it? This isn't the, the blinding, flashing light. It's a conversation between two people about what they're having for dinner. God's sovereign over humanity down to that small sense of detail in the ordinary every day of, of his people quietly getting on with their lives and their conversations and their interactions with people. And as you think about the week ahead, maybe you think about some of those conversations you'll have with work colleagues or with family members, or friends, or neighbours, when you go back out onto your front line where you spend most of your time rubbing shoulders with those who do not yet believe, consider the places where God has put you, whether that's college, or school, or university, or a workplace, or your family, and say, God, would you be graciously at work? Can I trust that you're sovereign over humanity, even through those who do not yet know and love you, that I might see you graciously at work in my life? Well, God's sovereign over history, God's sovereign over humanity, but God is also sovereign over his people. The last of the, the God gaves comes in verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. So we turn over to verse 17, and all of a sudden, three years have passed. Three years of vegetables and water. Yeah, they've got there. Th their training has come and it's gone and now they stand before the king in the ultimate interview of all interviews. The king's going to ask you about all these things. He's going to really probe you and see if you've understood the new literature and understanding of this kingdom that you've just had three years to learn. And King Nebuchadnezzar tests them and finds that their learning is, well, it's way past the others. They pass this test with flying colours. They're ten times better. Do you see God being sovereign over his people? Uh, giving them that knowledge and understanding, that learning and skill in literature and wisdom in just three years. God's sovereign over his people. 
Now, yes, don't, don't forget that they've worked hard. They were clever guys. They were intelligent and they studied. But God gives them their knowledge, their understanding. God's allowed them to go through all of this hardship. And all of this heartache, remember they've been ripped out of their own land. They're living in a foreign land where people don't worship God. They've been weeping for Jerusalem. But God's sovereign over his people and their circumstances. I wonder if you see that in your own life. Do you acknowledge that the the very gifts God has given you are, are to be used for his honor and his glory? Now, you might not be as fit and as strong as Daniel and his friends. That's all right. You might not have the the wisdom and learning of them, and that's okay too. But the gifts God has given you to uniquely be you and work where he has put you. Do you acknowledge, God, you've, you've been gracious to me. You've given me the sufficient grace that I need. You're sovereign over me and my life. And if you want evidence of that, then look to the very last verse. Verse 21, because verse 21 at first glance seems like an incidental historical detail, but it's beautifully brutal. Verse 21, Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, look where the chapter started. The chapter started in Jerusalem with King Jehoiakim. Well, he's come and he's gone. Then there's been Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Well, by verse 21, they've come and gone too. What verse 21 does is hit the fast forward button 69 years. You've just whipped over 69 years there in in one verse. So Daniel's about 80 years old at this point. Cyrus, king of Persia, is now in control. You're now in about 539 BC. Jehoiakim's come and gone. Nebuchadnezzar, well, he's come and gone. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, but God and his people remain and carry on. Now, I think at this point, Daniel's no longer fresh-faced and looking very fit. I reckon his back aches and his hair's gone slightly grey. He's got a few wrinkles. The kingdoms have come and is gone, but God and his kingdom and his people go on and on and on because God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And these kings just come and they go and God remains sovereign over all. God's kingdom, the kingdom that, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the kingdom you're part of with Jesus as your king. And that kingdom is a kingdom that never ends, that never fails. God's sovereign over his people. And what does he do? Well, he sustains Daniel all the way through that journey. Yes, he's still living in exile. He's still living in this foreign land. He's still living in this place that doesn't regard God as king. But God has been faithful to him all throughout his life. God continues to be sovereign over every detail of his life, even 69 years later, when he's about 80 years old. Perhaps you can see God's sovereignty in your life, working through the purposes and circumstances that you face right now today, and trust that he will continue to do so, not just today and tomorrow and this week ahead, but in the months ahead and the years ahead. And the time to come to say, Lord, I trust you, that you're sovereignly at work in my life. God's sovereign over the world events of history. God's sovereign over humanity, even over those who don't believe in him. God's sovereign over his people. And what does God do? God gave, God gave, God gave. And that tells us the simple gospel story, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has given us his son, and to his son, God gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, whose kingdom will know no end. My friends, Daniel's God is our God. The God who's sovereign over history and over humanity and over his people is sovereign over us and our world today. As you think about that today, would you allow God to give you hope then in a hostile world? Hope to step out of this building and perhaps go back into that difficult home situation or neighbourhood situation or work situation this week but to live out your life of faith with hope in God, saying, God, I I trust you for all that has passed, but all that is to come. God, give me hope as I go out into the hostile world this week. Well, our last song is going to help us to prayerfully put that into practice as we declare 
a, a statement of faith that says, what is our hope in life and death? Well, it's Christ alone. Where's our only confidence that our souls belong to him? Who is it that holds our days within his hands? What comes apart from his command? What will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. So we'll sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Let's stand. We'll sing this uh, together and give thanks to God. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are in control of all things, everything that's going on in this universe. Lord Jesus, you are holding all things together, including our lives. You're a great God, so big, we can't even get our heads around how big you are, and yet you're so intimate and you care so much that you're sovereign over us individually, you're sovereign over this church, you're sovereign over all churches around the world across all of history, and it's only through you that we find hope 
in difficult circumstances. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us, despite what's going on in this world, what's going on in these local communities, that you would remind us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. That we would not fix our hope and our minds and our eyes on this dying, passing age that just keeps on changing and keeps on dying, but we would fix our hopes on your kingdom that is forever. And our Lord who does not change is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we thank you uh, for speaking to us this morning. We thank you for being close to us. And we ask that you would accept our praise because we come to you not in a righteousness of our own, but in the righteousness of Jesus. And it's through him we come to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray this all for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen.